Tamsin Lewis and I'm an early music practitioner and historian. In my talk today I'm going to try and map out London as it was in the 17th century using dances and music from the publications of John and Henry Playford. John Playford published his dance manual, The English Dancing Master, in 1651. This was the first book of English dances to be printed and it contained music and choreography for more than a hundred dances. It was so well received that it was reprinted with a few additional dances in the following year, and then again through some 18 editions and some supplementary books of dance melodies in the years up to 1728. A second volume was added in 1710 and a third in about 1719. In all, these volumes contain more than a thousand melodies and choreographies, providing an invaluable insight into the social music and dance of the time. Many of the dance melodies found in The Dancing Master are duplicated in other collections printed by John and Henry Playford. Examples of these are Music's Handmaid, which was for the keyboard, Music's Delight on the Cittern, and Apollo's Banquet, which was for the violin. These books also contain other dances that are relevant to today's talk. Unlike many of the music books of the time, where pieces are just given the name of the type of dance that they are, be it saraband, bore, minuet, jig or whatever, most of the dances in Playford's collection have specific and often imaginative names, something that I find fascinating. The dances are named for a wide variety of topics. These include foodstuffs and animals, festivals, seasons, dates, battles, theatre plays, items of clothing, famous people and places. More than 200 places have dances associated with them. There are streets, lanes, alleys, yards and squares, churches, halls, great houses and castles, taverns, markets, fairs and theatres, parks, greens, commons, fields, gardens and forests, caves and villages, towns, cities, counties and countries, and the majority of these are places or buildings in what we would now call London. I'm going to look at a few of them here. Playford himself was a Londoner, although the London that he would have known was very different from the London of today, with the name of London itself being applied to what we would now call the City of London, the city bounded by walls and by bars. Although even by Playford's time it had begun to expand beyond these walls. A little to the west of London was the City of Westminster. This was a separate city. During Playford's lifetime and that of his son Henry, London changed beyond recognition due to the Great Fire of London in 1666 and the subsequent reconstruction works. John Playford lived in Arundel Street, which was built on the site of Arundel House. He rented a shop within the Temple Church for two pounds a year from 1642 until his death more than 40 years later. Playford's shop sold not only books, musical or otherwise, but also instruments and medicines. Among them, Dr Turner's dentifrices and Sir Kenelm Digby's sympathetical powder. His customers included Samuel Pepys, who bought a copy of The Dancing Master in 1662, the composers Henry Purcell and John Blow, and the poet Nahum Tate, who wrote an elegy for Playford's funeral in December 1686. He is thought to have been buried in Temple Church. John Playford's son, Henry, carried on his trade, working from his father's shop until 1695, when he moved to a shop on Temple Change, next to St Dunstan's Church in Fleet Street. He stayed there for nine years before moving to Middle Temple Gate. Whether by chance or by design, there seems to be a concentration of dances and melodies associated with this area around the Temple and Fleet Street in the music books of John and Henry Playford. 
These include dances for temple, temple bar, temple change, a jig for the middle temple and one for the inner temple, and a melody for St Dunstan or Clifford Inn, which was right by it. There's also a dance for Maypole Alley, which is where the Maypole at Temple Bar was stored. <laughs> That piece is named Temple in The Dancing Master, but it's probably more familiar to you as Jeremiah Clark's Trumpet Voluntary, otherwise known as the Prince of Denmark's March. The material included in The Dancing Master wasn't written by Playford himself, but was a collection of popular country dance tunes and instructions, some dating back more than a hundred years. While few of the tunes actually give the name of a composer, it's still possible, as in the case of the piece you've just heard, to identify the original source of some. Many of the places named in dances can still be seen today, and I'll show you some of those. This is St Martin's Lane. And St James's Park. Here is Catherine Street. This was newly built at the time. It was named after Catherine of Braganza, Charles II's queen. Here is St Margaret's Hill, just off Barra High Street. And Maiden Lane. <laughs> London Bridge is still well known to us, even if the original bridge has been demolished. St Paul's steeple, which was struck by lightning in 1561, was long gone, even in Playford's time, although old St Paul's church itself survived until the fire before being rebuilt. Other dances take more research to locate them, as they've been built over or have changed their names. One example of this is Millfield, which is found in the first edition of the English Dancing Master. Millfield was an area of some eleven and a half acres, south of Oxford Street and on the east side of the highway to Charing Cross, which is Swallow Street on this map. It's thought to have been named for Tyburn Mill, which was not far away.
example of a vanished place is Horsey Down Fields, also known as Horsley Down or Horser Down. This was a place in Bermondsey, to the east of what is now Tooley Street, where horses were pastured, feeding on grass that was made lush by the waterlogged fields. A fair was also held there, and you can see that in this painting by Hofnagel. The fields were built over many years ago, but the place of the fair is still remembered in the name of the road Fair Street. And this was originally called Horseydown Fair Street. The River Thames was extremely important in Playford's time. It was one of the easiest ways for people to travel or for goods to be transported, so it's unsurprising that there are a number of dances named for wharves, water gates, ferries and bridges. Here are a few. Paul's Wharf appears in the English Dancing Master of 1651. The wharf was to the south of St Paul's Cathedral and was the favourite point for the clergy there to begin and end their travel. It was said to date back to Roman times. Billingsgate was a water gate on the banks of the Thames where goods might be landed. It was a general market for all sorts of goods but from the 16th century it became known specifically as a fish market and in 1699 an Act of Parliament was passed making it a free and open market for all sorts of fish whatsoever. The only exception to this was the sale of eels, which was restricted to Dutch fishermen whose boats were moored on the Thames. This was because they'd helped to feed the people of London during the Great Fire. Putney Ferry and Lambeth Ferry are reminders that there was only one bridge in London and that it was necessary to find other ways to cross the water Lambeth Ferry was a horse ferry and it was primarily set up to link Lambeth Palace, which was the residence of the Archbishop of Canterbury, to the Palace of Westminster. The first specific reference to it is in 1513, when the Archbishop granted the ferry over the Thames from Lambeth to Westminster to Humphrey Trevilian at the rent of 16 pence a year, with the provision that the Archbishop and his servants and his goods and chattels should be carried for free. 17th century London was full of churches, and Playford's dancing master reflects this with dances called All Church, St Albans, St Brides, St Catherine's, St Dunstan's and St Martin's. There's also a short piece of music called Bow Bells that appears in Music's Handmaid and in Music's Delight on the Sittern. These were the bells of St Mary Le Beau, just by Cheapside, and they were said to be so loud that they could be heard as far away as Hackney Marshes or, according to legend, Highgate, where Dick Whittington heard them calling him back to London. Without a TARDIS, it's very difficult for us to know how most of these dances were given their names. A few of them are easy to place, but I've really struggled with the rest. It may be that they were named after the place where they were first danced, or that a wealthy patron paid for something to be named after his house. In some cases, the title may come from the lyrics of a song or ballad that was sung to that tune. And in some cases, the dances are named for plays. There was a fashion among 17th century dramatists for what is now known as place realism. This was naming a play for a place and setting the drama in that location. Looking at the dates of publication, I think it's more than likely that some of our London dances may originally have appeared in these London plays. Thus, the dance called Hyde Park, which appears in the first edition of the English Dancing Master in 1651, may come from James Shirley's play, which was performed first in 1637. Richard Broome's play, The Sparagus Garden, was also first performed in the 1630s, but it was revived in the 1660s, and it seems the likely source of the dance Asparagus Garden, which is found in the 1670 edition of The Dancing Master. The Asparagus Garden itself was situated south of the Thames in Lambeth Marsh, and it was known as a place for lovers to meet.
The Dance of Greenwich Park may well come from William Mountfort's play of that name, which was first performed at the Theatre Royal in 1691. Thomas Baker's comedy, Hampstead Heath, was first performed at the Drury Lane Theatre in 1705-6, and a dance of that name appears first in the 1710 edition of The Dancing Master. This tune is interesting, as it has two different choreographies. <laughs> Another play that falls into this category of place realism is Sir Charles Sedley's play of 1668, The Mulberry Gardens. A dance called The Mulberry Garden is found in editions of The Dancing Master from 1670 onwards, and a different melody with the same name occurs in the supplement to the seventh edition, printed in 1687. Sadly, this one doesn't have dance instructions. In the early years of his reign, King James tried to set up a silk industry in England, and he had mulberry trees planted in part of what was then St James's Park. His attempt failed, but the mulberry trees stayed, and the area became known as Mulberry Gardens, a fashionable place. People went there to enjoy cheesecakes, syllabubs, and wine sweetened with sugar. The mulberry trees are still there to this day, and they're in the grounds of what was once known as Buckingham House, another place with two dances to its name. It is, of course, now called Buckingham Palace. Pleasure gardens like the Mulberry Garden were very popular in Restoration London, and there are quite a few dances and melodies named for them. I'll look at a couple of them here. The dance called Spring Garden first appears in the third edition of The Dancing Master, printed in 1657. I think that it's most likely to refer to an area near Charing Cross. Popular from Elizabethan times onwards, its amenities included a bathing pond and, briefly, a bowling green. After the restoration, the land was built on. Another favourite place was Lambeth Wells. There were two main wells, and there's a dance for each of them in The Dancing Master. Lambeth Wells in the 1698 edition, and Lambeth New Wells in 1726. The waters of Lambeth were widely advertised as a medicine for many ailments. Benjamin Allen, writing in his book The Natural History of the Purging Waters of England in 1699, says that this water, beside the virtues which it hath in common with other purging waters, has the property of curing leprosies and cleansing and clearing scorbutic scurs and spots. People would go to the wells for their medicinal properties, but there was also a great room for music and for dancing. Its opening is described in this advertisement from the London Gazette of April 1696. Lambeth Purging Waters in Langton Gardens, Lambeth Fields, near the Three Conies, will be opened tomorrow. The place is extremely pleasant and fitted for the entertainment of persons of all qualities. On Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Fridays the music will be continued until four in the afternoon and the other days until seven. <laughs>
The Three Conies is thought to have been a tavern, and it gave its name to a street just by the Lambeth Wells, Three Coney Walk. This is the dance of that name from the 1726 edition of The Dancing Master. Three Coney Walk was renamed Lambeth Walk later in the 18th century, and this is the same Lambeth Walk which was made famous in the dance of the 1930s. <laughs> from the Three Conies, there are other dances associated with taverns. One of them is the Hole in the Wall, and there were quite a few of these in London. There was one in St Dunstan's Court near Playford Shop, one in Hopen, and one in Chandos Street, which was run by a mistress of the Duke of Buckingham and was notorious for its criminal clientele. Claude Duval, the highwayman, was arrested there in 1669. It's still used as a pub to this day, although it's been rebuilt and is now known as the Marquis of Granby. There are also dances for the Queen's Head, which was on Fleet Street, and the Punch Bowl on Drury Lane, and in Apollo's Banquet there is a Fleece Tavern rant. The Fleece Tavern was in Bridges Street. Many parts of what we would now think of as London were small villages or towns in neighbouring counties. Thus dances with titles like Turnham Green, Whitechapel, Kensington or Belsize referred to places in Middlesex and Camberwell, Nine Elms and Blackheath were then parts of Surrey. Each of these would be some distance from the gates of London so a visit to them would be quite an expedition, and it's unsurprising that dances called after Marylebone, St Pancras, Kilburn and Islington are all prefaced with a trip to. Looking at one of these, Islington was known for its dairies, so much so that in an entertainment of 1575 it was suggested that Islington's arms should be three milk tankards proper on a field of clotted cream, three green cheeses upon a shelf of cake bread, a fermenty bowl stuck with horn spoons and for supporters a grey mare used to carry the milk tankards and her silly foal. The motto, fresh cheese and cream. On your trip to Islington you might have a chance to visit the wells and there were also wells nearby at Sadler's Wells in Clerkenwell. Like Lambeth Wells, Sadler's Wells initially became known for the health-giving properties of its water. It also had a music house built by Richard Sadler in 1683. Entrance was only threepence, for which patrons could take the waters and enjoy the gardens while listening to the music of violins. Later on, more elaborate instrumental and vocal music were offered along with dancing and more outlandish entertainments from sword dancing to eating live cockerels. Sadler's Wells remains a famous venue for dancing to this day, but two other Clark and Well places of entertainment found in The Dancing Master are now long gone. The first is Hockley in the Hole, a muddy area in the valley of the Fleet River, a haunt for thieves and for highwaymen and a place notorious for bear baiting. The dance first appears in the English Dancing Master of 1651.
The second place is the Red Bull Playhouse. This was an in-yard theatre built in 1605 and its plays rivalled those at the Globe and the Rose. During the Civil War and Interregnum, when other theatres were closed or pulled down, the Red Bull remained open, offering illicit performances of jigs and rolls and rope dancing and much more. It was demolished during the early years of the Restoration, but its location, Red Bull Yard, can still be seen on Ogilby's map a few years later. The Red Bull doesn't appear in The Dancing Master until 1698, although the melody appears in Apollo's Banquet in 1670 and a ballad entitled A Mad Kind of Wooing, dating from about 1619, bears the tune direction to the tune of the new dance at the Red Bull Playhouse. The metre of this ballad matches the Red Bull melody from Playford, so it may well be the same. This certainly isn't the only example of older dances appearing quite late in The Dancing Master. A little to the south of the Red Bull was Smithfield, and there are two dances associated with this area. A little to the south of the Red Bull was Smithfield, and there are two dances associated with this area. Pie Corner was at the top end of Giltspur Street and at the southern end of Smithfield. John Stowe, writing in his Survey of London, says that the name comes from the sign of the pie, a fair inn for receipt of travellers, but now divided into tenements. Pie Corner is also known as the place where the Great Fire of London stopped. Bartholomew Fair was held each year in Smithfield at the end of August in the days around the Feast of St Bartholomew from the 12th to the 19th century. It was the largest cloth fair in the country and was also known for its pie powder court and for its entertainments, puppet shows, rope dancing, ballad singers and other strange sights. Ben Johnson used it as the setting for his play Bartholomew Fair in 1614 another example of place realism.
This late 17th century ballad describes some of the things that you might have seen at Bartholomew Fair. All those that have money and want any wear, let them walk to Smithfield and Bartholomew Fair. All sorts of movables there may be had. You must venture your lot amongst the good and the bad. Gloves, ribbons, knife scissors with jack in a box. Fine ladies with patches and powdered with box. With a cock and a gelding with whistle and rattle. All which serve to please the young kids that can rattle. Their children must wear the if that they have any. It is forty to one that they have a great many. The climate is fruitful, the soil fat and good. All things to be said for to nourish the blood. There's no fear of increase, which if they can go, they must do the fair for to see a great show. Being dressed very fine like young lords and ladies. The boys must have coats and the girls must have babies. The sprightly young apprentice must not be forgot. One day in the fortnight must fall to his lot. The servant made way with him, so trim doth he take, and briskly doth treat her with a pot and a cake. If his purse be strong, he will venture to see the monkeys to dance and the goose with legs three. All this having seen, he home doth repair, being enough to talk of until the next fair. Once in the year to eat a pig's head takes his wife to the fair. There is no denial, he with her must go and takes in his pockets an angel or two. Then merry they make while the music does play. But if I'm not mistaken, for dear they must pay a crown for the head of a pig three weeks old. All this must be had, for the mistress was sold. Lads and fine lasses make haste, and some of these Bartholomew rarities taste. No question, but all of you will have content, and that of your money you will not repent. Make use of your time, whilst time you have here. Who knows who shall be at the fair the next year? Merry Andrew doth call you, the music invites to partake of the pleasures and taste their delights. Green Goose Fair was another annual London fair. It was held the Thursday after Pentecost in a field in Bow, in what is now called Fairfield Road. John Taylor describes the fair in his book Taylor's Goose, printed in 1621. Goose Fair at Stratford Bow, the Thursday after Whitsuntide. At Bow, the Thursday after Pentecost, there is a fair of green geese ready roast, where, as a goose is ever dog cheap there, the sauce is over somewhat sharp and dear. Like Buckingham House, there is more than one dance with the name of Green Goose Fair. The first one can be found in The Dancing Master from 1670 onward as an alternative name for Solomon's Jig, which first appeared in the second edition of 1652. It's also found in Music's Delight on the Sittern in 1666. The second dance to Green Goose Fair dates from 1718. The fair itself continued until 1823 when it was stopped due to rowdyism and vice. <laughs> Thank you. 
Another annual London fair with two tunes to its name is Mayfair. It's given its name to an exclusive area of London, but the original Mayfair was held during the first two weeks of May in the open fields beyond St James's Park. It was also known then as it was also known as St James's Fair because of its location. In 1686, the fair moved to Great Brookfield, which is the area around Curzon Street and Shepherd's Market. Attractions of the fair included bare knuckle fighting and women's foot racing. There are a few more dances named for places around Mayfair and Piccadilly, some of which are still to be seen. This is the dance for Burlington House, which was built on Piccadilly. It's named after Robert Boyle, the Earl of Burlington, who bought the site in 1667 and completed the house that was then under construction. It's been modified many times over the centuries and is now best known as the home of the Royal Academy. Other wings of Burlington House are now used by a number of famous societies, including the Linnaean Society, the Society of Antiquaries and the Royal Astronomical Society. Another great London house that is now a museum is Montague House. Viscount Montague built two houses on this site. The first, designed by Robert Hooke, was destroyed by fire in 1686. The dance that we have is first printed in 1710 and so it's likely to refer to the second Montague House, which would have been new at this time and was one of the grandest private residences of the day. Montague House was sold to the trustees of the British Museum in 1759. It would be demolished in the 19th century to make way for a larger building. You can see Montague House clearly on Hollow's map and close to it St Giles Pound, which was a cattle pound at the intersection of the roads from Hampstead and Oxford. It became the point where distances to London were measured. Wallingford House stood at the end of the tilt yard in Whitehall. The house gained its name from Sir William Knollys, Viscount Wallingford. It was subsequently owned by the Dukes of Buckingham before being appointed for the Admiralty Office in the reign of William III. Admiralty House stands in its place now. And this is Ham House. Situated by the river near Richmond, Ham House was built in 1610 and was remodelled in the 1630s by William Murray, former whipping boy to Charles I. This dance is also known as the Cherry Garden, and this is because Ham House was famous for its cherry garden. An inventory of 1653 records that there were 84 cherry trees planted there. <laughs>
dance called Blackwell Hall appears in the second volume of The Dancing Master from 1710 onwards. Blackwell Hall stood just to the east of the Guildhall, as you can see on Ogilby's map, and it was the centre for the wool and cloth trade in England from medieval times until the 19th century. Cloth manufacturers and clothiers would come here from all over the country to display and sell their wares to merchants and to drapers. Westminster Hall is one of the only surviving parts of the medieval palace of Westminster. This palace was the primary residence of the kings of England until the residential apartments were destroyed by fire in 1612. Most of the rest of the medieval palace burned down in 1834, but the hall still stands and is still used today, one of the oldest parts of the Parliament complex. Whitehall was originally known as York Place, as it was the residence of the Archbishops of York from the 13th century until it was appropriated by Henry VIII in the 16th century. The Palace of Whitehall became one of the main residences for the Tudor and Stuart monarchs and grew into a vast sprawling network of more than 1500 rooms. It was destroyed by fire in 1698 and all that now remains is the Banqueting House built by Inigo Jones in the early 17th century. There were plans for rebuilding the palace and there is a dance called New Whitehall which appears in The Dancing Master from 1701 onwards. I've described some of the London places that share their names with dances and music printed in the 17th and 18th centuries. Some of the places can still be seen today, while others are just memories. They're preserved in records and old maps and pictures. There are many more. I'd have loved to have gone through them too, but there wasn't time. So I'll finish now with the music for a dance called Palmal. Mal.